Jesus today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We just want more of Jesus. Father, everything else fades in comparison to you. There is nothing that compares to you. There is nothing. Thank you for being our healer. Thank you for being our provider. Thank you for being our peace. Thank you, thank you. Aren't you thankful this morning? Yeah, awesome. Well, while you guys sit down, why don't you turn to someone and just say, God is good to me. Well, my name is Amy. Um, I get the privilege and the honor of sharing the word with you guys today. And uh, these last two days, Rick has really been sharing testimony after testimony of what um, God has done. And I encourage you guys, if you aren't here, go back and listen to those because it will stir your faith up. It will stir your faith up so much because our hearts, they were made to see signs and wonders and miracles. That's it's supposed to be a part of our everyday life. And as Christians, it should be our normal because we serve a God of miracles. Isn't that amazing that he is our God of miracles? And as my heart was stirred up these past few days, I just, I was hungering for the miraculous. And, and in that hunger, God was reminding me of rest and of expectation, how to live a life of restful expectation. And so that's what I want to share with you this morning is, is what does that look like? What does a life of restful expectation look like? And how do you live your life that way? Because you, each and every one of you, were made to see signs and wonders and miracles, but it's not through our own works. It's not through our own hands. It's not through um, our great effort. It's through us resting with Jesus that will step into the supernatural. So let's look at Revelations 19.10. Uh, It says that this, I fell face down at the angel's feet to worship him, but he stopped me and said, don't do this, for I am only a fellow servant with you and one of your brothers and sisters who cling to what Jesus testifies. Worship God. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So it's the testimony of Jesus that's stirring up the heart. It's not the testimony of Amy, even though it can be an awesome moment that happened in my life. It's the testimony of Jesus, and it's all because of God. God gets all of the glory and all of the credit. It's the testimony of Jesus. So we are designed to live a life full of miracles and signs and wonders, but we are also designed to live with restful expectations because we need to remember that my point number one is that we were designed to rest. I heard it said one time that to fail to see the value of simply being with God and doing nothing is to miss the heart of Christianity. And lately God's really been talking to me and Jacob about um, about setting aside our Sabbath, about setting aside our rest day, because it's so easy to go all seven days of the week and get things done and be busy, but it really amounts to nothing if we don't go back to the core foundational truth that God says in Deuteronomy 5.12, it says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. So it's not a suggestion, it's a command. We were designed to rest. It's the day where we stop working and we receive what he's done for us. Because rest, it means to remain confident and to cease striving. And our Sabbath day, it's a day to remember the goodness of the Lord. And sometimes that looks like going and laying out in the sun all day. Sometimes that looks like reading a good book or just spending the whole day with someone that you love. But it's so important to begin our weeks from a place of rest. And it's not the other way. We need to switch our mentality. It's not, I have to work six days so that I can rest. It's I rest and that fuels the other six days of the week. Because we were designed to live in rest. We were designed to live in peace. And when Jesus was on the earth, he often withdrew from the crowd. 
He left and he prayed and he was resting with the Father. And Jesus is our perfect theology. So why don't we fix our eyes on Jesus? Let's look at how he did it. So if Jesus had to withdraw, then I probably need to withdraw as well. And I don't think those times where Jesus was with the Father, I don't think that it was completely filled with running around and fervently praying and demanding every miracle that was going to happen. You know, I don't think that it was completely filled with um, him shouting his to-do list at the Father, saying, I got to do this, I got to do this. But Jesus withdrew to simply be with the Father. And it probably looked different every time. I'm sure that there were those times where he was passionately and fervently praying, fer- fervently, <laughs> that's a word, it's a word today, praying to the Father. And I'm sure some of those times he was just with the Father. Because there's so much beauty in just being with the Father. I'm sure there was times where they laughed, where they cried, where they just talked. Time with the Father was the secret to Jesus' success. That's the key right there. Time with the Father was his success. And a great natural example is in marriage, I'm not constantly at 100% every time I'm with Jacob. Sometimes we just sit together and we relax. Sometimes we lay in our hammock and we fall asleep and we take a nap. Um, Sometimes we have conversations that go on for hours and hours. But it's just the simple act of being together. Because every time I choose to be with Jacob, I get to know him a little bit better. So every time we, we choose to be with the Father, we get to know him a little bit better. And that's what the Father wants. He wants to be with us. He wants to commune with us. He wants to, us to know him, and he wants to know us even better. And let's look at this beautiful picture of the Father choosing to be with us. Let's look at Genesis um, chapter 1, verse 27. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Let's skip down to verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God says about all the other days that they were good, but this day he stops and says, it's very good. And then it says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. And do you guys know what comes after the sixth day? The seventh day. It's not a true question. (laughs) The seventh day. (laughs) It was the day of rest. It was the Sabbath. So let's keep reading. Genesis 2, starting in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So on day seven, God steps back and he looks at all of his creation and he says, wow, that is good. And then God looks at Adam and and this is just how I'm picturing it. God says, I took the whole day off for you. I just want to be with you. I spent six days creating, but this day is just about me and you, Adam. I just want to be with you. And maybe Adam's response was, I haven't done anything yet. You gave me that great commission yesterday to rule and to reign, and I haven't done any of that. But maybe God's response was, exactly. It begins from rest. It begins from relationship. Adam's first day on the earth was a day of rest. And everything Jesus did was an overflow of relationship. From those times he withdrew, he withdrew to rest with the Father, to just simply be with him. Because each and every one of you were designed to do great things, but God's design is that you do the commission from the blessing. Verse 28, God blessed and then he commissioned. When you get that backwards, that's usually when burnout happens. It's when you, you work for his pleasure. But we are designed to work from his pleasure. We don't work for his delight. We work from his delight. And God, he wants Sabbath to be play. He wants it to be fun. He wants it to be a delightful day. It's a day just to enjoy God and his creation. Because you need rest. You were created to rest. 
And then when we live our lives from a place of rest, that will compel us to live out the commission that God has called us to. Because God loves us for who we are, not what we do. The other six days, Adam was meant to rule and to reign. But every week on that, that Sabbath day, whatever day it is, you choose to be with the Lord. It's, it's just a day, it's a reset of remembering when your relationship began with the Father in the garden. And when you choose to rest, you're honoring the image of God in you. You're remembering the time when you dined together with the Lord in the garden. Because you were designed to rest. And then point number two, you were designed to be fed. So can you imagine day six, the first thing you see when you open your eyes, you picture that you're Adam here, is you open your eyes and you see God. That's incredible. And God knelt down and he formed Adam and he breathed life into him. And the very first thing Adam does is he breathed the breath of God back out. And all of creation echoes dependency. You know, the flowers, they need the sun, they need the rain. Our lungs need oxygen. We are created to need and to be dependent. And in our natural bodies, we get hungry every day. Every day I wake up and I think, wow, I'm hungry today. And that's a good sign because hunger, it shows you that you're alive. What I loved was those stories that Rick shared the past few days. A lot of people that got healed off of their deathbed, one of the very first um, symptoms of their healing that they encountered were they were hungry. It showed that their bodies were working again, and it told them, hey, I need some food. I need some nourishment. And just like our natural bodies need food, our spirit needs food. Our spirit is hungry. Every single morning we wake up, our spirit needs to be fed. We need the infilling of who the Father is. I want to know what moves his heart. I want to know what he's saying and what he's doing today. I want to know what brings him pleasure. I don't ever want to get to, that, to a point in life where your heart is so hardened that you don't sense the pleasure of the Lord. So if we have to be fed, how do, how do you fill yourself up? So you get to choose. What do you want to eat today when you dine with the Lord? How do you hear God's voice the best? How do you receive? You get to choose to eat from the buffet of the Lord today. He prepares a feast for you. So is it going to look like I'm going to take a walk today and just spend time with God? I'm going to read his word and be nourished from the word of God. Or I'm going to schedule a date with God and just bring a pen and paper and let him speak to me. It doesn't matter how you choose to feed on God's word. Just make sure that you do. Because our very lives are dependent on the word of God. And what's awesome is Jesus, he feeds us with the promises of the Lord. Because it's the promises of the Lord that will sustain us through any situation and any circumstance. Because if I know that I'm healed, it doesn't matter if I'm on day one of walking out my healing or if I'm on day 100 of walking out my healing. I still know that God is my healer. I have that promise of the Lord that is nourishing me each and every day. Because in the Bible, there's example after example. Noah didn't know how long he would be on the boat. But he had that word from God that said, I will establish my covenant with you. And what I love is it says, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. And it was a promise of the Lord that sustained Noah through that whole season. And Saul in Acts 9, after his encounter with the Lord, on the road to Damascus, he didn't know that he would just be blind for three days. He could have thought, man, I'm going to be blind the rest of my life. But he got up and he entered the city like the Lord told him to, because God said, once you enter the city, it will be told to you what to do next. And so he got up and he went. So what are you going through right now where you don't see the end in sight? What are you going through where you might feel spiritually blinded, what has God asked of you that you are still on the journey and you have yet to see the floodwaters recede? Because I want to encourage you today to keep going. Keep standing on what God has told you. God said that he would establish his covenant with Noah. So Noah did according to God's word and God established his covenant with Noah. What I love is uh, Jude 1.20. It says, build yourselves up on the most holy faith. 
So these great men and women of the Bible, they wouldn't have been able to follow through if they didn't have a confidence in the Lord. And you build up your confidence by spending time with him, by reminding yourself, by feeding your soul on the word of God. And in Acts, the disciples of, um, of Jesus, they were waiting to be filled before they went. They waited. Jesus was going to fill them up, and then they went out. Which leads me to point number three, that you were designed to minister from a filled and restful place. Because you can only minister to the depth that you've slowed down and you've let God minister to you. You can only receive to the depth that you've allowed God to give to you. Let's read an example of this in um, John 21. I love this story. It's a, starting in verse 12. Uh, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. I love breakfast. <laughs> None of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, tend my lambs. And so this was a story of Jesus showing up to, this, to the disciples, and Jesus invites them to come and have breakfast. And he ate with them. He dined with them. He spent time with them. And it was after the, he, they finished eating that he gave Peter his great commission. Before Peter could go and feed the nations, Jesus fed Peter. Before we can do ministry, we have to receive because and usually inside of our ministry, there will be natural gifts that we, that we can use to further the work of the Lord. Um, because Romans eleven twenty nine 29, it says that the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. So we each have gifts that God has given us, and we can totally use that gift and 100% leave God out of it. What a tragedy that would be that we can spend our whole lives furthering our ministry using our gifts because the gift will be there whether we ask the Lord to be in it or not. And it's our hearts that will help determine the pleasure of the Lord. And I want the pleasure of the Lord upon each and everything I do. I can have a great gift for worship, but how much sweeter will that gift be if the Lord is on it? And Rick's been talking about signs and wonders this week. And sometimes it's so easy to do, do, do. I'm going to go and do ministry. And we can get our eyes on ourselves and think, oh, it's by the works of, of our hands. It's by my great effort that all of this is happening. But I have a secret for you. It's not. <laughs> it's not by anything we've done. It's by the Lord. And I want the pleasure of the Lord. I want the nourishment of the Lord to be upon the gifts and the callings of my life. And I can't enter into that unless I first rested and received from the Lord. Jacob and I, we recently had a chance to speak at a class. And we were both so physically tired. We were just drained, felt like we had nothing left. Um, and I honestly felt like it was the worst teaching of my entire life. It was terrible. I couldn't connect any of my thoughts. And I was like, this is the worst. Um, but you know what? God still showed up. A girl got saved, and another girl got filled with the Spirit. And, our, and just when we were driving home that night, we were just kind of chuckling, and we were talking about, wow, God uses us, but none of it happens because of our great effort, because it was really not a good effort that night. <laughs> and it's really honestly very humbling. It takes your eyes off of yourself. Yeah. you know, And it shows you that God is going to show up no matter if I just bring my measly crumbs to the table. He's going to turn it into a feast for me. Matthew 6, it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And in his kingdom is rest. In his kingdom is relationship. In his kingdom is nourishment. So seeking his kingdom will be restful. Seeking his kingdom will be peaceful. And when I seek his kingdom, I'm expecting all of my needs to be met. And I'm expecting to have more than enough, to have an overflow of his kingdom within me that whoever I come into contact with, I just kind of leak his kingdom onto them. So I want to ask you this morning, what is your expectation? Are you being fed from a place of rest? 
Are you expecting the help of his presence? Or are you just trying to go about the promises of the Lord without the Lord? We need the help of his presence. Let's, let's live with the expectation that he's going to show up, and when he shows up, he's going to come with his help. He's going to come with his grace. Psalms 54, 4, I love this verse. It says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is a sustainer of my soul. He is a sustainer of our souls. We've seen it be, happen before that if the enemy can't get our hearts to stop burning, then he'll, he'll get us to burn out through ministry. And I want to see a healthy revival come to Santa Maria. I want us to live and to flourish from a place of rest and nourishment with the Lord. And then my closing verse, Acts chapter 8, verse 7 Philip was in Samaria at this time, and this was his reality. And I want my expectation to be there, to see this in our city. It says, For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many of who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. I want our city to rejoice over the goodness of the Lord. I want to stand in amazement at what the Lord has done because as we enter a season of seeing many, many, many who are paralyzed, lame, and blind, and deaf be healed, our city is going to take notice. And we will see the Lord be made famous in our city. But let's not forget to live from rest and to let the Lord nourish our souls. All right, let's pray. Father, would you remind our hearts to rest? Would you stir within us the desire and the hunger to be fed and to be nourished by you? Don't let us go out and minister with empty wells. Father, would you fill up the wells of our heart once again? For you are the sustainer of our souls. You sustain us, Father. No matter where we are at in the journey, if we just receive the promise, if we're 300 days into walking it out, or if we just receive the fulfillment, Father, would you encourage our hearts today? We have such an expectation of living our lives from rest, of living our lives from communion and fellowship with you. We thank you, Father. Thank you for feeding us, for nourishing us. Thank you for allowing us to rest with you. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Amen.